welcome to Nerd Talk. I'm Pixie. I'm Seb. And I'm Pyrosin. And tonight, Diablo 3. We're suffering from massive finger-related stress. Well, you might be. Like, seriously, this index finger, dead. Uh-huh. So, Sen, have you beaten it? I have. I have finished Diablo on normal. If you can actually consider <laughs> that beating the game, which most people don't. I, I, I consider that beating the game. Especially so, yes. because I'm in it more for the story than the loot grind. You poor, poor man. Well... That especially works out for me because I played through the starter edition and then decided not to buy it. I actually, I liked the gameplay well enough, and it would have been worth the money, except for the being online all the time turned me off, especially because I got, like, significant lag in the single-player mode. As it like, should. That is probably the worst feature incorporated into this game. And then, the other thing that turned me off about that is that I'm well-documented as liking to cheat in video games. And the DRM is also anti-cheat. I'm like, but cheating is one of the funner parts of video games. Right. You you finish the game the legitimate way. Why and then not afterwards. go through it as, like, a god amongst men destroying everything? Well, he doesn't want to do the legitimate part to begin with. Right. No, no, I, I do the legitimate part first. <laughs> right, but then part of the fun is... I'm going to do this just rampaging through everything. I mean, that that's part of the fun of uh, Dead Space. When you finish the game the initial way of the terrifying, do I have enough ammo and life to live through this? Going through it a second time with, yeah, I've got this gun that just one-shots everything, is entertaining. So I, I guess we can jump on into it. Um, Diablo 3, for the most part, is exactly what you would expect from Diablo 1 and 2. It is a... Dungeon Crawl, Hack and Slash, Loot Fest. That, that is exactly what this franchise is through and through. I mean, there, there's not a ton of story here, and I think Blizzard knows that it's not needed. Well, there's not a ton of story here, and most people aren't coming from the, for the story. I think I'd like to do spoilers today and yeah, go we're, over we're the events. Yeah, we're spoiling it, because I've got some massive complaints. Okay. It is one of them that Leah, nothing is told what happens to her after the end? Oh no, she's dead. We know she's that. Dead? She's I, dead? I've, other people have complained to me that the ending is very unclear as to Leah's fate. No, her... It's pretty much established that if Diablo possesses you, you're dead. Well, that happens to the Wanderer, I guess, but... It happened to the Wanderer, it happened to Prince Albrecht. Anyone Diablo has possessed, their soul is, for all intents and purposes, dead. Hmm. So the moment that Leah was possessed by Diablo, her soul was no longer in her body, she is dead. So what does it mean to be a Haradrim? And you might not have the answer to this. The but... Haradrim are an order of monks that were originally trained by the heavens. Okay. So an angel came down and gave them knowledge of how to fight demons. So, then Deckard Cain was the last of the Haradrim, and Deckard trained Leia. Wouldn't that... And apparently Leia just sucked at her job, because she was too busy being a giant Mary Sue. Yeah, there was a pretty funny Penny Arcade that was posted. Oh, hang on, I can pull up the litmus test. You two, you two keep going on, I'm right. going to pull this up. On, I believe, Monday. And that was... Th throughout the story, Leia is like, Nah, Deckard Cain is just an old loon, and his prophecies about Diablo coming are crazy. Yeah, Which, she meets an angel at the end of Act 1 and is just like, Nope, still not happening, not real, maybe Uncle was just insane. Super hilarious in the context of the fact this story is taking place in Tristram, which has very clearly been destroyed by Diablo personally twice, and yes. there are all these zombies and demons who are trying to siege the town, and yep, she's like, Leah, nah. Nope, not real. Uncle... Uncle Deckard was just crazy. Um, clearly you're in denial. It's, well, what about that meteor that fell on your face? That didn't you know, do anything the, for the you. The one that contained an actual angel. Nope. A person who, when you handed him his sword, immediately gained glowing golden armor. So that, I assume, is Tyrael. Yes, that would be Tyrael. The angel from the previous games who has decided to become mortal because he feels he can be more useful to the humans if he can directly intervene. 
Have you seen the animated short where an Imperius cuts Diablo in half? Yes, yes I have. So, do you get to kill Imperius in this game? You do not, unfortunately. You confront D Imperius, but he gets taken down by Diablo. Ah. Like, there, Act 4 of this game is literally Diablo laying siege to heaven. It is incredibly cool to watch. Which is I, what I was just doing. <laughs> sounds good to me. Is that yeah, the but, last act? Yeah. The, the game takes place in four acts. You start off in Tristram, then you move to the desert area. From there you go to the ruins of Mount Ariat, which was destroyed at the end of Diablo 2. And then you go to the High Heavens. Mount Ariat, is that Act 6 from the act from Lord of Destruction? Yes, that's the final act of uh, Lord of Destruction. Okay, so that's kind of like Homeland. a tundra, cold place. Yeah, but now it's a, a gaping, open portal to hell. Hmm, in exciting. In what's left of the, uh, the mountain. Sounds like my hometown. Right. So the main <laughs> the main plot has you chasing down the last of the lords of hell, uh, Belial and Asmodan, who are each on earth just doing their own thing. When you hear about this magical MacGuffin called the Black Soul Stone, which is currently housing the three prime evils that you had beaten, is uh, there so, a lot of any description at all of what the heroes of Diablo Two were? Actually, um, the Barbarian of Diablo 2 is the Barbarian that you play in Diablo 3. If you play as a male Barbarian, you are playing as the same character. Well, that's really cool. Who has aged greatly during the 20 years that took place between the games. Well, I'd expect. Man, that's one battle-seasoned Barbarian. Yep. Um, you also encounter a Templar who joins you as a support character who is not the Templar from Diablo 2. Uh, you do encounter a necromancer as one of the random events in the desert area. So they they do make mention of the other characters. But, like, the Dark Wanderer was the main antagonist for most of Diablo 2, and the yeah. Dark Wanderer is the hero of Diablo 1, who yeah, is Aiden, actually, son of Yeah, they the actually Orc. named him. He is the uh, king's second He's Aiden, son. Aiden, son of Leoric. Yeah. And he was the warrior class. Yep. Uh, the game makes the assumption that there was more than one hero in Diablo 2, because it constantly refers to uh, Mephisto and Diablo's soulstones being destroyed as the heroes. Uh-huh. Well, that makes sense. And you, you do encounter those classes in the various random events that take place in the game. Incidentally, there, there were actually three mentioned heroes from Diablo 1. The Diablo 1 rogue became Blood Raven, who you kill in Act 1 of Diablo 2. Yeah. And the Diablo 1 Sorcerer became the Summoner, who you kill in Diablo 2. Oh, cool. Yeah, so you do encounter these people. Um, the majority of the story is told by a fully animated cutscene that occurs at the beginning of each act, and then kind of book cutscenes that are narrated by whatever character you choose that take place during the three stages of each act. And the so cutscenes are, of course amazing because Blizzard oh, yeah, has they're, a they're CG Blizzard department cuts. to rival Pixar. Right. The Specifically the two Heaven cutscenes are absolutely gorgeous. The best particle effects that I've ever seen done by a, a CG studio. Like, I, I have no problems with the graphics of this game. I'm, I'm currently running it on a desktop that is uh, five years old. It was designed to run the first Crisis at above average settings. It can run Diablo 3 at all of its highest settings at perfect frame rate. So, I, I've never chugged. The only time I've experienced any kind of lack of gameplay is when it's been lag on Blizzard. When it's been server lag. Right. That's pretty funny. Uh, one thing that really bothered me out of the demo is you don't save your map progress if you quit the game and reopen the game. No, uh, that's that's a standard Diablo thing. It's randomly generated maps, and if you leave the game, it resets the map because it assumes that, hey, you might want to do this section again. Really? I, I guess 
that must well, be it's true. It's always but been like that. I, I felt like in Diablo 2, the maps were randomly generated, but they were saved once they were generated. I they guess weren't. not. No. That, that has always been a Diablo thing. Like one, one of the things that's bothered me the most about this is I, I've tried going to the forums a couple times to just look up things if I've had a question of, well, why would I want to use this move? Are gamers just worse at everything now? I, I kind of feel like, like that. I, I was reading a post from one of the players that was like, oh, the loot generator's so broken in this, I never get anything I want. Like, that that's part of Diablo. Like, the, yes, the loot generator is 100% random. At no point does the loot gener take, generator take into account what you might want. Because that's part of the point. Yeah. Like, I, 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 are gamers just worse at everything? Uh, maybe this is just me coming to wikis earlier in a game's lifespan, but I do have the impression that wikis are less well filled out than I remember them being. Right. Well, Which is weird, because more people are playing and more people are internet connected, but it no, just seems I, I that way. I was looking over other complaints about certain classes that... Ah, oh, why does my class get, like, one-shotted on Nightmare and Hell Mode? Because it's Nightmare and Hell Mode? Yep. Rats, you're, you're playing the game on hard and very hard. That That's how it's supposed to be. I mean, I, I always remember the wizard classes in Diablo pretty much getting one-shotted when things got to them. That's uh, why you have lots of skills to keep things off of you. I was amused by a Penny Arcade news post describing the Demon Hunter as having brittle bone disease. Oh yeah, you disintegrate. Like, straight, like, it's Joker from Mass Effect. Just straight um, up. I'll, I'll put it this way. The boss of Act 3 on normal mode hit me twice with his strongest attacks and I died. Ouch. However, the next time I played, I dodged correctly and had him dead in 30 seconds. Because that's what the Demon Hunter does. Well, it makes sense. Also, Chivos. Woo, she Chivos. She a single target and she kills it. I am a big fan of Chivos. And especially the fact that Blizzard has its By own which integrated we gamer <laughs> Yeah, the fact that Blizzard now has gamer scores that go over all of their games is kind of cool. I, I like the basically thinking of my computer as the Blizzard console. That makes sense. It's pretty entertaining. I am baffled by the fact that other studios don't have game. Well, actually, Ubisoft has something kind of like that. They have points you earn in achievements that you can actually spend for, like, mini DLC. And it's kind of weird, because you can even spend them across games. Which, I, I well, like the idea of being able to buy mini DLC with achievement points. They... The thing you kind of unlock in Diablo with your achievements is your player banner. So, oh. when you jump into someone else's game, around the, the main waypoint stone, there will be a banner placed for each character. And your achievements unlock different aesthetic design choices that can get put on this banner. So, for instance, for beating the game as my Demon Hunter, I unlocked a Demon Hunter-themed sigil to put on this banner. That's pretty cool. You, you can also unlock custom shapes for it, uh, custom patterns. In videos, they're, they're I've nice seen people slamming their banners down at places other than around the waypoint. What's the deal with that? I do not know what that's all about. I think I think that might be part of the PvP system that was in beta. Oh, that might make sense. That when you challenge someone, the banners get put down. So, one other reason why I feel like Leia might be able to survive being possessed is that she was the spawn of the Dark Wanderer when he was possessed. So, right. she has angelic anti-demon knowledge as a Haradrim trainee, and she is part Yeah, but devil. she was frankly bad at being a Haradrim trainee. Well, yeah. Yeah, that's true, but... Like, no, I'm pretty sure Leah's dead. I mean, I'm, I'm waiting for the inevitable announcement two years from now of the expansion pack coming for Diablo 3, 
because there is a big open thread that the game could pursue of, hey, Le uh, Leah's mother got sent out by Diablo into the normal world to go do stuff when he left for heaven. She's still out there. We need to hunt her down. So her mother is Adria the Witch. And... Yes, who was mentioned in the original Diablo. Right. Actually, no, wait, she was in that, wasn't she? She was one of the merchants. Yeah, she was a merchant. She's actually right. a fairly significant character in the original Diablo. Right. As, as much as the original Diablo had characters, of course. Hey, I remember Wurt. <laughs> well, everybody remembers Wurt. And then in Diablo 2, I killed him and stole his leg. Which should lead us directly into Whimsy Shire. Which, I was very disappointed at first, before I read anything about Whimsy Shire, that I thought it didn't have any canon continuity with the cow level. But actually, it does. Because... <laughs> You talk to the ghost of the Cow King to get into Whimsy Shire. And I thought that was awesome. You know, Blizzard does inject all of their humor into the game. And I think that's great. You know, ju just conversations that take place between NPCs are fantastically funny. I absolutely love the Enchantress character in the game, because she is hilarious anytime she talks. Yeah. You know, her, her and my Demon Hunter, totally BFFs, they chat all the time. <laughs> My, my demon hunter seems to think that the spells that she writes are equivalent to the demon hunter's emo poetry. Probably true. It's like Vogan right. poetry. It's just, it does damage by merit of being so boring. So pathetic. The demon hunter can either read poetry or shoot things. The, the bullets are less cruel. <laughs> Actually, that's one of the disappointments I've had. I really wanted a black powder weapon for my demon hunter. And I'm sad that I, I will never get it. There aren't any? No, there are no black powder weapons in the game. The closest I can get is my odd dual one-handed crossbows. Lame. That shouldn't work. <laughs> so I played through the demo as a wizard. I thought it was yep. kind of funny that you can equip sort of any main hand weapon, and then you mm -hmm. don't really use the main hand weapon for anything. You just no, use you them just to cast use spells. To your spells. So, yeah. I, I have a wand, and I have an axe, and if I cast Magic Missile by waving this axe around, I do more damage than if I cast Magic Missile using this wand. It's like... Yeah, it's kind of a weird system, but I think that they didn't want to restrict anyone's weapons for fear that, you know, someone's going to discover a way to use this effectively, and it's going to be awesome. Uh -huh. Let's not restrict that. Like... You'll have a restricted weapon for each class. Like, I don't think any other class can use the one-handed crossbows. Uh-huh. I think those are Demon Hunter exclusive. Um, I know there's sickles that are barbarian exclusive. There's daggers that are exclusive to the Witch Doctor. And I can't remember what's exclusive to the Mage. I think specifically the, the staff. No one else can use that. Uh-huh. But uh, you also have signature pieces of armor for each class. The wizard oh has the wizard god, hat. Oh my god, your levels are all over the place. Could you please stop spitting around? <laughs> Sorry. Um, the demon hunter has a specific chest piece that only she can use. Uh, the barbarian has a signature belt, which is kind of weird. So, But everyone gets some things that are just for them. It makes sense that the, everybody can use everything, but I feel like... If the wizard just got, like, a bonus to spellcasting if they had a wand equipped, that makes sense. Just, like, a 1.5 DPS bonus or something. But well, it's all cool. Yeah, it, it, it just looks funny in the, the animation to be casting a spell with this axe. I just point oh, this yeah, axe in looked, front of me. It looks really weird, and specifically some characters, it would be better if they were just restricted from using the weapons entirely. Because if you equip a, uh, a, a melee weapon... Most of the Demon Hunter skills just vanish. You can't use them at all. So leaving that option open to players, I think, is kind of confusing. Well, I I think that's okay. I guess somebody who doesn't play games would have a problem with that, but... Right. I... I will say what's really awesome is the new revised skill system that leads to just unprecedented levels of customization. Uh-huh. Okay, so, so here's how it works. Once you've unlocked a generic skill, 
From then on, you will unlock runes that fundamentally change the way the skill works. When, so, oh, when Pixie okay, and I played the Old Republic, Pixie always comments on the fact that committing a skill point to the skill tree, the button is called commit. And, and it makes me nervous. Diablo 3 has absolutely zero commitment zero, in character yeah, spec. No committing. You can change your mind completely at any time. It's like, it's not bad enough I have to lock them in, but these assholes have the, have the audacity to call it commit. And I'm like... I'm afraid of commitment. Um, I so, am also uh, afraid of commitment, so I was pleased about being able to respect at any time in Diablo 3. Yeah, at any time you can change your skills. So, for instance, uh, the Demon Hunter starts the game with this thing called Hungering Arrow. It's basically a shot that has a chance of redirecting into a second target. Kind of cool. When you get the skill, you have no runes activated on it. It's just, it does what it does. But, at level, I think, 7, you unlock a rune for it called Hungering Arrow. It increases the chance of it doing the second shot. From there, you unlock Cinder Arrow. It's another rune. You have to equip one or the other. This one changes the skill to, oh yeah, it sets the arrow on fire and gives it a, uh, the ability to light the target up. Cool. Right now, the rune that I've got on it is called Scattershot. So there's a chance that rather than it breaking off and <laughs> attacking another target, the arrow itself will split into three arrows that will do that. It, it just changes the way the skill works. And through using different runes, especially with the wizard, you're changing everything about the skill. Uh-huh. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it, it's awesome to think that, yeah, every single move in the game is potentially up to six different moves So that all work together in different ways. Were you playing with elective mode on? I, I have been playing with elective mode because there are, frankly, a couple of ability trees that I'm just not using. As far as actually, I can tell... Correction, looking at my Demon Hunter right now, I am actually using the, the mode exactly like I would be if I was playing without elective mode. I have one of each ability set. There is no reason for anybody to have elective mode turned off. And it's a little weird that Blizzard buried it in a menu and didn't tell anybody about it in the game. It, it's really kind of a hand-holding thing. Because all it means is when you don't have elective mode on, you can only put skills from a certain tree into each slot. Whereas yeah. with it turned on, you can use any skills you please. If you have a skill, you yep. can use it. And it's like... Well, it, it could lead new players to making the mistake of like... There, there's two different types of moves, essentially. There's moves that generate your resource and moves that consume it. Every single class has its own unique resource for using abilities. As opposed to the last version of Diablo where every class had mana, which was kind of weird. That's right, this barbarian knows how to use mana. So what do they call the resource... Are there resource recovery potions? No, there aren't? are no resource recovery potions anymore. Like I said, there are skills that generate your resource and skills that use it. Uh huh. The thing that you'll primarily be equipping to your uh, left-click button will probably be one of your generating skills. And likewise, the thing you'll be equipping to your right-click button will probably be one of your resource-using skills. Uh-huh. Well, for the wizard, which I was playing, there kind of isn't yep. much resource generation. You just have specialty skills which don't cost any arcane power, and if you're not using arcane power, it comes back quite quickly on its own. Yeah. And there's actually a skill that you get pretty early on as the wizard called Power Hungry, where every time you pick up one of the new life orbs that drops off of a target, it also regenerates an equivalent amount of arcane energy. Uh-huh. That, that's one of the other customization things. You have three passive abilities that you get to set. And, and the list of passive abilities you can choose from is actually incredibly long. It, it's like 20-plus skills, I think. Uh, no, 15 skills, actually, now that I think about it. it. It's 15 skills that you get to choose yourself that just do random things that you don't have to select on your character. So, for instance, I've got one that just increases the crit chance of my bows. Uh huh. It's a skill that I picked. I've got another one that, if there is not an enemy within 10 yards of me, 
all of my attacks do 20% more damage. Very nice. I feel like yeah. elective mode is sort of severely limiting the abilities of people who play games for the sake of people who don't, because you can make yeah. way more sophisticated combos with it turned on than with it not turned on. Absolutely. And it's yeah. not introduced and... anywhere. Like, the only no, way you I... know about it is if you heard about it online or you dug through all the menus. I had not heard about elective mode until I read an article on GameSpot telling me what it was and that I should be using it. And upon reading that, I was like, what? This is great! It sounds a lot to I me don't... like the Dead Space, or the Dead Island, rather, uh, analog stick weapon control. Uh, Pixie, mm -hmm. you played Dead Island, right? A little bit? Yes, yes I did. Did you ever use the analog weapon control thing where it mapped the stick to your hand and you move the stick around to move the weapon? Moving a stick. I, I, I had only ever played it with the mouse, so I, I didn't have my... I remember being told at some point that you could just plug in your Xbox controller and being completely mind-blown by that, and then I, I just had lost interest in playing the game before I got around to testing that. Uh -huh. Well, probably even if you had been playing it on an Xbox, you would not have found out about this mode because it was buried in the menus, but a lot of people say that it makes the game way more interesting because you can target... Uh, Dead Island had limb damage so that you could have their arms or legs broken of the zombies. Mm -hmm. And by swinging your weapon around in specific ways with the analog stick, you could make the combat way more interesting. But it was buried in the menus, and nobody played with it because of that. I feel like elective mode is kind of because of that. Kind of similar to that, but probably everybody will find it, because people play, who play a lot of games, play Diablo 3. Right. Yeah, I... I understand why Blizzard did it, because they wanted to show you each of these sections of moves as they became available. Like, if you're starting a new character, you do not have all of your skill slots available until you hit, like, level 12. I don't think it's more than that. I think it's, like, 15 when you get your last uh, number key available. But it's just because they want to slowly uh, build you into the game. The demo cut, cuts off at level 11, but I killed the Skeleton King at, like, level 8. Yes. Um, and kind of the way I killed the Skeleton King was by my follower died all the time, and then i just run around and sort of get out of the Skeleton's King range, and then my follower yeah. would just wake back up. That Templar is super useful. <laughs> it, do you get more followers than the Templar later? Yes. Uh, before Act 1 is over, you pick up the Scoundrel, who is a ranged DPS character. And then later you pick up the Enchantress, who is kind of your magical buffer. Cool. But by the time you're halfway through Act 3, or sorry, Act 2, you'll have all of your followers. And when you play the game again on a New Game Plus, or Nightmare Mode, you'll retain all your followers. That... In addition to that, you retain all of your gold and the experience of your craftsman dude. That seems a little weird that if you just roll a new character, you start with an endgame craftsman and all of your followers. Well, the game's restriction of needing to be a certain level to use gear keeps that fair. That, yeah, you can't just start a new game and go ahead and use all of your endgame gear on your new character. But... I guess if you're really into leveling up your uh, blacksmith or whatever, is there any way to start a new, a truly new run-through without buying another Battle.net account? I think if you delete all of your characters. Oh, that's harsh. I know. Well, I think Diablo 3 is really built on this, it is your Battle.net account that is allowing you to do all this. I mean, it's all even tied into the in-game auction house, which is actually really cool. It's one of the features I like the most about this, that because my characters all share the same gold pool and stash, if I go into the in-game auction house looking for an item... So I'm going to try this right now. So I just started a witch doctor, who I haven't even dropped into the game yet. I'm going to search using him for a one-handed... Witch Doctor exclusive weapon that will work for him for uh, level three, th level five. 
I posted a... Okay, when you go to the start screen on the demo, there is a line that suggests that you should buy the full game, and it says, click your way to 60 as one of the bullet points of the great things of opening the game, or buying the game. And I thought... Oh, was, yeah, Blizzard definitely has their sense of humor intact. It's funny that they call it clicking rather than, like, adventuring or something. But I posted a screenshot of this, and Pixie noted that your character starts as completely naked when you make a new character. I assume it does yep. that for all of them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was just like, where are your clothes? Thinking that he had done he had done something like what he does in uh, The Old Republic. Stripping down and dancing on That's some surface. MMO tradition. <laughs> which, which character did you start as? A wizard. Female wizard. Yeah, a female wizard doesn't start with, with much clothing. Oh, so other people do maybe start with something. I just thought it was funny um, that... I guess the wizard starts with a wand. Yeah. It seems funny but to like be wandering as, into like, Tristram without any sort of gear. But, like, so you're just in your knickers with a wand? That's. Yep. Uh, apparently, you show up apparently, you sold all of your clothing to get to Tristram. I mean, that sounds like that sounds like a. How do I want to put this delicate? That sounds like a fantasy themed stripper party. <laughs> That just sounds and dangerous. I, I think part of it's designed just to show how pathetic your level one character is. Right. And it makes sense from this like, being a yeah, loot game. Because you get your very first thrill of loot by being not naked anymore. So. Right. They give you a powerful first hit. Right. And again, I, I really like the auction house system. However... I'm really not looking forward to the live, real currency auction house coming up. I, I think that's garbage. I, I don't want to see that in this game. I'm okay with it, but I'm really disappointed that that is sort of what precipitated the fact that there is no cheating and no offline mode. Yeah, well, that, that was part of the frustration of Diablo 2, that Blizzard realizes... People want to use real money to buy items and characters for this game. Admit it, I don't understand it. But people do, which but is why it, gold farmers exist. Seems, yeah, it, it really bothers me that, wait, because of these people, I can't play my game the normal way? What? Actually, Diablo 2 had a sort of interesting approach to that, which is that they had an online mode and an offline mode, and your characters couldn't transfer between them. So, you had an offline mode, which you could cheat at and whatever, but none of that loot was tradable with anybody, and you couldn't right. do any multiplayer with those characters. Which seems like a much better way to do it than having everything be online. I mean, admittedly, it was frustrating to get like a level 50 character or whatever that you can't play multiplayer with, but it is better than not having any offline option at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the part of the always online thing that I'm actually enjoying is the fact that it, it automatically imports your friend list from the other Blizzard games. So if you have friends from StarCraft or you have friends from World of Warcraft, the game automatically imports them into Diablo 3. That's great. And then from there, they can see if you're online, and you can just jump right into someone's uh -huh. game. If they're on your friends list. So if I, for instance, pop on and see one of my friends is online in Act 3, I can send them a quick message and be like, hey, would you like a hand with that boss? And get on one of my characters and just drop right into their game and teleport right to them in under 30 seconds. And that is totally awesome. Actually, yeah. I every time Pixie and I play the Old Republic, I tend to say, oh, they should really include a spell that lets you teleport to your friends. And Diablo 3 yeah, has that. The party members or something. Part of that's what the banner system is in Diablo 3. I can jump into my friend's game, their banner will be sitting right next to where I appear, and then I can just jump right to them. Or I can right-click their portrait and say, teleport to this player. And the other nice thing about Real ID is that there's cross-game chat, even. So if you see somebody yep. playing World of Warcraft, then you can hop on that, or they can hop on Diablo 3. And you can even talk to mm -hmm. each other across the games. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, that had happened when I was in StarCraft a couple times. Someone would message me from World of Warcraft, wondering why it had been so long since I played. <laughs> oh, well, that's I view that as the downside. Games right. are too high pressure. I don't want pressure to play games. <laughs> you could set yourself to appear offline if you really like. Yep. Too bad League doesn't have that. Anyway. Hey. You have anything else about Diablo 3? Um, well, my only major complaint about the game in general is the story is incredibly weak. Um, but... But that's because if you're coming to Diablo, chances are you're you're here for the barest you're of minimum stories. coming for the stories. clicking. Yeah, you want to click, you want to get loot, you want to move on to the next thing. Um, the story is functional, although I really dislike the Leah character, just because she had so little personality to her. Like, the game wants me to feel bad that this uh, woman that I had traveled with got screwed by her own mother and then annihilated by a demon lord that was actually her dad. Reward, please. Betrayed. That will work for <laughs> Like, you want me to feel bad for this character, yet all she's done the entire game is repeat narrative. That's it. She has been there to repeat things like, uh, I'll give compliments to their writing for my character, because there was this great moment in Act 2 where I got betrayed by this guy that I was helping. Like, I, I helped bring this ancient Haradrim wizard back to life. And my demon hunter is like, I was wondering when you were going to betray me. Now I get to shoot you. Just Ooh. like, yeah, who didn't see that coming? <laughs> and I need to ask, uh, Cain dies. When does he die? Oh, I just know Cain, that it happens. What's Cain the deal with it? Cain dies two-thirds of the way through Act 1. And how? And it's sad because when they go into the inevitable Diablo 4, the linchpin of the Diablo universe is dead. Stay a while and listen. Right. Come play with my Herodric cube. Listen to me as <laughs> I impersonate Sean... That sounds incredibly Sh dirty. Uh, Come yes. listen as I impersonate Sean Connery. Like, it It kind of sucks. Like, I was assuming they were going to end the game with Leah taking up Kane's role, and so Diablo 4, you'd have Leah waiting in town giving you exposition. Nope. Went and killed her. Like, honestly, if Blizzard finds a way to bring back Leah, I'm going to be kind of disappointed. Kind of. What can I say? I was looking forward to putting a few crossbow bolts through her. I wouldn't be surprised if she comes back. I, I haven't actually seen the ending, but from what I gather, it seems She's not, not outside the realm of possibility. You cease to see Leah anymore the moment uh, Imperius burns her body away to reveal Diablo. Yes. Leah, Leah shows up at the gates of heaven with Diablo in her, and then before she walks through the gate, her flesh has been entirely burned away, and all that's left is a feminine uh, body Diablo. <laughs> feminine Diablo? Yeah, the, the new Diablo art is totally... Uh, has widened hips and actually has, like, a... the bone structure above the chest is simulating breasts. But still kind of quadrupedal and red-skinned and horns? Quadrupedal, red-skinned, forearms. It's just a more feminine version of the Diablo form. <laughs> Freaky. That's... Yeah. Okay. It, it's, a little, it's a little weird looking, but it suggests that demons somewhat take the form of whatever they possessed. Now, is it possible that that is not Diablo, but like Diablo offspring? No, you no, know for a possible. fact that it is Diablo. It introduces itself as Diablo. Okay. Uh, that it is now the prime evil because this was apparently Diablo's plan the entire time that, yeah, I'm going to get all of my evil brothers imprisoned in this black soul stone with me in it, and then I'm going to take possession of uh, Leah with all of the other evils to create one giant super evil entity. This was apparently all planned from the first game. Great. I'll take it. You know, I don't need a lot of story. If they just execute on this sort of really lightweight stuff well, that's good enough yeah. for me. It, it's functional, and like, the more interesting things in the game are, are the mini-events that you get. The, the little things that you get while roaming the world that aren't 
the big picture and are completely random whether you get them. But, like, I thought the exposition of finding the necromancer from Diablo 2 out in the desert trying to seal some ancient souls so that, uh, so that the, the cult that you were chasing couldn't use them. That was cool. Yeah. Hearing your NPCs talk to each other and talking to them about their past is awesome. I mean, the Enchantress is a really interesting character. She's a sorceress from 15,000 years ago who was uh, put to sleep by an angel to come help you. Hearing that the barbarian is the same barbarian blows my mind. It, it's really awesome. Pretty cool. It was like I participated in the blowing up of my home. I haven't had anywhere to go since, so I'm wandering. So, I guess that will wrap up our coverage of Diablo 3 for this week. Yeah, for the most part, it's, it's really good. It's really enjoyable. If you liked Diablo 2 at all, 3 is more of what you like streamlined. Instead of spending $60 on Diablo 3... Steam has been having some crazy good sales over the course of the last week. So, really? I, I've spent $40, and I got Rayman Origins, uh, the Ghost Recon, the Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon pack, and the Thief pack, which has Deadly Shadows, Thief 2, and Thief Gold. Nice. And I only bought the Thief pack today, but I played a fair bit of Rayman Origins, and it's really good. It, also, Dead Island is 60% off. You can get it for $12. I heard something about there being a Game of the Year edition of Dead Island, which maybe has DLC that might be different from this. I don't know. But keep an eye out for that if you're thinking of buying Dead Island on Steam. Fair enough. Rayman Origins is a lot like New Super Mario Bros. Wii because it has a Powerful jump-in multiplayer aspect. Uh, lots of split-screen. Well, not even split-screen. It's same-screen multiplayer on PC or any of the other consoles it's on. And if you get hit like you would die in a regular platformer, you turn into a big bubble that you can be revived by running into your friends. Uh, that is a lot like New Super Mario Brothers. <laughs> that's a lot like New Super Mario Brothers. It throws you in and does not explain any of the mechanics until a bit later in the game. So there's these dull, glowy things that are called lums that you collect because, I don't know, they're smiling and if you run into them then they blink away and a number increases in the corner. But eventually you find out that you're collecting electoons, which are smiling pink faces that are basically like stars from Mario 64. They gate your progress to the next area and stuff. And lots of platforming levels. They have time trials, and you earn extra electoons by collecting enough lums. And Rayman still doesn't have any arms or legs. Oh, you're saying... L I, keep, I kept thinking you were saying lungs, as in the sacks in your chest that you use to breathe. No, no. L-U-M's, which I think... I will collect all of the enemy's lungs. Do you see how confused I was? <laughs> I can see how that would be pretty confusing. I think their name is derived from illumination. I think they have something to do with light. It sounds like we're just copying all of Mario, because now we're taking things from Galaxy. It's a lot like Mario, but very good art, very good animations. It's cute. It's got good music. As actually, there's these things called Royal Lums, and when you pick them up, you get like a 30-second song that plays, and while that song is playing, you get double lums from the regular lums, and that 30-second time trial song was looping in my head yesterday, and I was like, oh god, I must go faster to collect them all while they're doubled. I can imagine that being problematic if that get tune gets in your head while you're, like, in the bathroom or something. It's kind of oh annoying. Oh god, I have to go faster. <laughs> <laughs> but that mechanic actually makes the gameplay kind of super dynamic because there's the... You'll be going through and punching enemies and jumping over pits and stuff. And then you'll have these mini time trials scattered throughout the levels. Uh, there's lots of secrets. There's hidden rooms that have special electoons in them. There's hidden pirate coins that you get more lums if you collect them. 
So, they expect you to replay levels quite a bit, because there's lots of hidden stuff, and there's time trials, and it's pretty good. I, you know what you're getting into if you know anything about New Super Mario Bros. Wii or something like that. Uh, probably the biggest draw would be the multiplayer. Sweet. I also played Ghost Recon Island Thunder, just a little bit of it, and Ghost Recon Advanced Warfare 1 and 2. And Island Thunder seemed, like, really cool. I was not expecting much out of it, but then I was really surprised by how neat it seemed. I only played, like, one level, which took, like, 45 minutes, even with abusive quick saving and quick loading. But the way it works is you control like a squad of seven guys and you can just swap between any of them at any time. And they have AI when you're not in control of one of them. And there's even a button that you can hit to go into spectator mode to make all of them operate according to AI. And you use that if you're like sending them across a big island. You can pull up a map and give them orders to go places. But... It's realistic military shooter, which means you can't take two bullets without dying. And so it goes a lot like you have to surround a camp and make sure you can kill all the bad guys before they can figure out what's going on and retaliate, or you're going to lose right. some of your squad mates. Yep. And so uh, it really appeals to me, just that specific gameplay type of... All right, here's the camp I'm going to assault. I'm going to surround it, I'm going to put a sniper up here, and then I'm going to quick save. I'm going to try it. And it worked, but I lost my sniper. And that's no good, so I'm going to load. I'm going to say, I'm going to move my sniper over here and move a rifleman over here and see what happens. Mm -hmm. it, it has a really good tactical interface. The, the ability to set what each of your squad mates are going And the requirement to, the fact that you can't just, yeah, one man solo gun this, is part of the strength here. There's also a lot of... You'll be moving through areas like jungles, and there'll be enemies that are sort of hard to see against the background. And so you've got to sort of watch where you're going when you're just booking it across the island, because if you're not being careful, there'll be an enemy hidden in a bush, and he'll kill you. It, it was appealing to me. I can see how it wouldn't be appealing to a like Halo fanatic who wasn't interested in anything else. Yep. But I liked it a lot. Uh, Advanced Warfighter 1 has a devastating bug on the PC version that makes it unplayable. Really? The way Advanced Warfighter works is that you're stuck in control of one person rather than controlling your whole squad, but otherwise it inherits a lot of the Ghost Recon mechanics. And as you're one person, you're giving your squad orders over your crosscom, which is mapped to middle click on by default on the PC. Except, apparently, for a lot of people, if you hit middle click, the interface for giving your squad mates commands does not pop up. And that happens to me, so I basically could not play Advanced Warfighter. That so, is truly an issue. If you're thinking of buying that alone on Steam, it might be catastrophically broken. <laughs> uh, but I moved to Advanced Warfighter 2, and that did not have that bug, and... It seemed pretty cool. It's a lot more modern first-person shooter seeming, because that you're the one person, there's no tactical map really, and you spend a lot more time moving around corners and shooting guys. But it still had a lot of quick load, quick save, plan your route of attack, so a nice hybrid between the two. Well, and I guess I actually played another game. It's apparent that school is over. I yep. actually have time to play video games. There's I bought gaming afoot. Company of Heroes on a Lark because it was on sale for like two dollars. I was expecting it to be a first-person shooter, but nope. actually it's a real-time strategy game. Yep. And so I got into it, and when it wasn't a first-person shooter, I was like, "Oh, th this isn't what I expected." And then I didn't play any more of it. You should play more of it, and we should talk about it next week. It, it has a real good meta score, but yeah, you you should try. Okay, I'll, I'll try it when I get some time, too. I was just so disappointed, because it seemed like a first-person shooter from its cover art and its name and stuff. Nope. I was it's like, a squad-based tactical shooter. 
So is it you, even you really a like shooter at all? Base or anything? Because it you looked have, a lot like Command and Conquer. No, you're not building a base at all. It is a top-down view. You are commanding a small group of characters with very specific skill sets. It's kind of like Ghost Recon the RTS. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll have to play some more of that and report Give back. Give it a shot. I think you'll be pleased. So, yeah. Uh, next week, plans. We'll definitely have some League to talk about because we're going to have a brand new champ coming out in the next few days. We're going to have Darius, who's pretty much the anti-version of Garen. It keeps throwing me off because Pyro and I knew somebody <laughs> I... in high school with that name. It literally took me until Pixie started speaking to figure out what the heck you had just said, because I was like, Darius, the person from my high school? What? <laughs> no, he's not a new League of Legends champion, although maybe. <laughs> well, we do have the confirmed list of nerfs slash buffs that'll be coming with this next patch. Cool. Well, do we want to go over it? Sure. Um, Ash is getting an entire new art asset set. They're, they're just replacing the character model entirely. Um, Which is good, because it was kind of ugly to start with. Caitlyn is getting a bug fixed. Uh, Cho'Gath is getting just redesigns to rupture. So the delay between him using it and it going off is being decreased. Is that where he stomps and the spikes come up? Yes. I'm they're disappointed that that's getting him. buffed, because it was really easy to dodge before. Nope, that always felt good be... when I dodged it. So yeah, I was like, yeah, I'm good at least. It's still going to be easy. It's only losing half a second. Or sorry, half a... Half a tenth of a second. The wow. delay is being reduced to... I'm not to... confident in your math skills, yeah, I'm sorry. just going to say. The delay is being reduced to 0.65 seconds from 0.7 seconds. That seems like a very small change. Yeah, it's not a big deal. Uh, Dr. Mundo's sustainability is being nerfed by 10%. That needed to happen. Yeah, Dr. Mundo was a boss. Yep. Uh, Fiddlesticks moves are doing more damage to minions. Uh, his Dark Wind specifically. The Bouncing Crow. Let's see. Um, Fizz is getting a bug fix. Gangplank is having a uh, quality of life fix added where it now displays the total amount of gold earned from his parlay skill on the tooltip. So, Gangplank players will now be like, yeah, I got 400 gold off shooting things. Woo. Um, Hecarim is being buffed. The devastating charge ability is being sped up, where it's reaching its full speed increase faster, and Rampage is doing more damage to minions. Lulu is being nerfed. Her Glitter Lance is going to be doing less damage. Uh, Malphite is being buffed. His travel speed and health are being increased. Morgana is being nerfed, which frankly needed to happen. Her her alt spell vamp is being reduced, so she's no longer going to regenerate like half her health when that goes off. Uh, Renekton is being fixed. That's that's just a fix. Twisted Fate, same quality of life thing, where the loaded dice are go is going to show how much extra gold he has generated through that skill. More information is good. Yep, and Zin Zhao is having a bug fix. The big deal that's being added to the game is the new item. Uh, finally, someone else is getting an item from one of the uh, refer-a-friend systems. Namely, a thing is finally getting his item. So, cool. what we have here is an item that finally builds off of the chalice that most of the MP dependent I am characters. so excited about this. Right, characters who build the chalice have been complaining for a long time that eh, it doesn't build into anything and just have to end up selling it. Well, now you've got something. 80 ability power, 36 magic resist, 15 mana per 5, 15% uh, cooldown reduction, and probably one of the coolest passives in the game. Namely that your mana will be restored for 12% of your maximum amount for every kill or assist that you get. Imagine Sona with that. Sona players, Merry Christmas. That, that's me flailing around and doing a happy dance. That's right. For every assist that Sona gets, 12% of her mana just came back. Which she can then use. To, so she pair, pairs off 
with the carry, who then, you know, she helps get assists, and then she could dump that extra mana into making them even more powerful. And it's nuts. You win a team fight, and then you have full mana again. In time to win the and next And then you can just fight. push. Ah, oh, it's great. So, I've got some funny bugs that are getting fixed that you might be interested in. I love reading bug fixes. So Because they, they're usually hilarious. These are co-op described. versus AI bugs. I, bugs I can't imagine old. they're as funny as the Old Republic bugs. Because the Old Republic tends to have bugs like... Fixed a bug wherein, by talking to a vendor, your character would be deleted and your debit <laughs> card would be billed sixty dollars. I don't know. Fixed a bug where players could not spam emotes to their heart's content. <laughs> okay, is that a bug or a feature? <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, let's see. So these are the bot bugs. Bots will no longer kill themselves by chasing enemies onto the summoner platform. Nice. Oh, well, that that was act that was fun when they would do that because it was really dumb, but kind You've of. You've already fun. lost the game if they're there, so. It's also a tutorial to players who have not played League before and right. don't know but that going on the enemy summoner you. platform will kill them. Uh, let's see. Fixed a bug where Shenbot did not learn all of his abilities. <laughs> <laughs> Fixed a bug where Ashbot would occasionally get stuck. Uh, toggling frost shot repeatedly. So have you ever seen Ash just standing there, making her arrow glow and not glow? That's what she was doing. I thought she was fapping. Fixed a bug where bots would use cleanse on knock-up or knock-back abilities. Wow. Wow. Fixed a bug where the bots would try to solo Baron at level 1. So yeah, uh, apart from this, they're also doing the massive Summoner's Rift graphic update, which is probably why this patch is taking a while. I, I they're don't... completely redoing the UI, too. Yep, the, the new UI will be in this patch. It, it should be a really good patch. This is a good quality of life patch. I looked at the preview and then got kind of mad that it wasn't implemented already when I went to, like, actually play a game. I was like, oh. <laughs> I want this to be pretty. Uh, you two were playing a game right before we started this show, and yeah. I tried yeah. to spectate it, but it was grayed out. What? You cannot spectate bot matches, unfortunately. Oh, you can't? You can only spectate ranked and normal matches. Fair enough. I, just I think what they the figured most that. people wouldn't want to watch bots. Well, that's stupid. <laughs> but it's dumb. And you're a duty head. <laughs> right. Duty. Poopy so, head. pretty sure that's all we've got for this week. I don't know, Pyro, we got anything else? Nope. Oh. I'll be playing the Thief games next week. Maybe some yeah, company Yeah, I'm going to see if I can get my damn index finger to stop clicking. Let's see. I'm trying to think. Anything coming out next week? Uh, Ghost, there's a new Ghost Recon game coming out, which is probably why the Ghost Recon pack was really cheap earlier. Ghost Recon Future Soldier comes out today. Yay. And E3 is in two weeks. Holy cow. I it's coming up quick. In the shadow of last week, which had Max Payne and Diablo at, like, Game of Thrones and Sonic 4, there's nothing yeah. at all coming out this week. I, I'm kind of determined, uh, yeah, no, that's actually, there. there's one thing coming out this week that's kind of interesting, but I'm kind of, like, not a big fan of the company that makes it right now, so I don't want to talk about it. Is the company Capcom? It is. Is the disc is the game going to have on disc DLC? Probably. Oh, you can figure it out yourself, viewer. Right. Let's it's Dragon's know. Dogma. Rawr. But that said, this time next month we'll be playing Lollipop Chainsaw. Woo! Lay side. It's coming. It'll be here. We're getting to it. Mario Power Tennis comes out June 10th. Pyro, totally thrilled about this. Mario Power Tennis, Game of the Year 2012. Nerd Talk Actually, approved. I'm really looking forward to Darksiders 2, which will be coming out in June.
I'm looking forward to Torchlight 2, which doesn't have a specified release date. No, it, it doesn't. Otherwise, I would have pre-ordered it right now. It has a pre-order also, bonus of Torchlight forget- 1, but I'm like... I already own Torchlight 1. End of the month sees the release of Arkham City Game of the Year Edition, and the final bit of DLC for that, the Harley Quinn's Revenge, which I'm actually really looking forward to. I will be rebuying Arkham City to play that. Very nice. Arkham City was like $2 on Steam two weeks ago or something, and I didn't buy it because I was like, never going to get around to playing it. In retrospect, maybe I should have, but... I I will be playing the Game of the Year edition. So yeah, this has been Nerd Talk. In the meantime, I'm Pixie. I'm Sam. And I'm Parasim. And you've been listening to Nerd Talk. We'll catch you next week. (laughs)